Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gein, and today we're discussing Canada's sex offender registry and a recent legal challenge to it. In 2011, the Harper government changed the criminal code so that the names of sex offenders were automatically added to the sex offender registry if they committed two or more offenses and were convicted. This automatic listing is now being challenged at the Supreme Court. The case involves Eugene Nedelevo, and he uh, pleaded guilty to two counts of sexual assault in 2015. He admitted that in 2011, when he was 19 years old, he sexually assaulted two women at a house party. He had no criminal record and was deemed a low risk to reoffend. But because he was convicted on more than one count of sex assault, his name was automatically added to the registry for life. Ned Levu filed an appeal with the Court of Queen's Bench in Alberta, arguing that his charter rights had been violated. His case is now at the Supreme Court of Canada. Here today to discuss this case are two legal experts. Christopher Badaluk is a criminal lawyer who represented Mr. Nedelevu at the Supreme Court, and Matt Gourlay is a criminal defense lawyer with Hennon Hutchinson in Toronto. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Uh, now let's start with the basics so that our viewers have an understanding of how the sex offender registry uh, works. Uh, Mr. Badaluk, what offenses would lead to registration as a sex offender? Well, it's primarily sexual-based crimes, such as sexual assault, uh, that gets you placed on the sex offender registry. Uh, that part is relatively uh, self-explanatory, I expect. Uh, so, Mr. Gourlay, what, what can you tell us about the public purpose of the offender registry? I mean, the origins of it are from a pretty horrifying case in 1988 involving the abduction, assault, and brutal murder of an 11-year-old boy. So how, uh, how does the registry help address the really serious law enforcement problem of sexual offenses? Well, you're right, Christine. It, the, the idea for a sex offender registry uh, came from the case that you mentioned in Ontario, which led on the province of, an, of Ontario to initially uh, adopt the first sex offender registry in Canada. That was later copied by the federal government to create a national registry in the early 2000s. And I think we'd all agree that the, uh, the purpose of it is laudable and important. The idea is that if the police have tabs on people who are sex offenders who pose some risk to reoffend, they will have a shortcut to investigating uh, sex offenses as they as they occur. So they have a repository of current information about known sex offenders that they can access when the need arises. Now, a question uh, has been raised in the in the case we're talking about today on how effective the sex offender registry actually has been in solving sex crimes. And that's a, uh, that's a topic of some, of some debate, but certainly at the level of purpose, nobody could disagree that it's important uh, to have uh, some sort of resource available to police in investigating these very serious offenses. Uh, now, Mr. Badaluk, Mr. Gourley had mentioned that this is a police investigative tool, which leads to the question I think a lot of our viewers want to know is, can the public have access to this registry? Uh, no, I, I mean, that is something that people sometimes wonder because uh, there's a number of similar uh, registries in the United States, which are public. Uh, but in Canada, access is uh, controlled and limited to those who are designated within police forces to have access to it. So, Mr. Gourlay, it's, it's not a publicly accessible. Why not? What, what's the rationale to make it only available to police and not to the, the general public? Well, I mean, I think we, as Chris mentions, uh, it's, we've strongly differentiated it from our American counterparts where these registries are public repositories of identifying information and photographs that can be used to sort of name and shame offenders in perpetuity. We in Canada don't believe that um, offenders, regardless of their crimes, should be out there um, identified by the state for potential uh, retribution and vigilantism. So it's uh, for the purpose of protecting the privacy of people who, although they've offended, still have uh, charter rights to privacy and dignity, we restrict access to, uh, to police forces, members of police forces who are uh, entitled to access it. That doesn't um, erase all of the stigma that goes along with registration as a sex offender, but it certainly addresses some of the more extreme versions of 
or the more extreme forms of disadvantage that come with an American style public registry. We've got to go to commercial break, but when we come back, I want to talk about some of the details of this particular case, as well as some of our other questions that people have about the sex offender registry. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing Canada's sex offender registry and some le recent legal challenges to it. Um, we're going to talk. We're talking first about a, a few questions people have generally about the sex offender registry. Uh, Mr. Badalek, one thing that people want to know is what what does being on the registry mean for people's day to day life? I, I know there are restrictions that are placed on a lot of people who have been convicted of sexual based offenses. Sure. Does being on the registry um, impact that or is is that a separate part of uh of of their sentence well what it is essentially is there's a series of registration requirements uh that certainly curtail people's liberty because uh everyday citizens can go about their day-to-day -day lives uh without having to inform the government of where they reside uh where they work where how they can be reached at their home and at their job uh, what volunteer organizations they participate in, uh, places they usually attend, the, those type of that type of information, uh, they're required to uh, inform the government with respect to that. Uh, volunteer organizations, their work and their home address, uh, their vehicle and their license plate. Uh, they're also required to report if they're going to be out of town for a number of days, when they're going to return, where they're staying, when they're absent from their home. I mean, these are restrictions we don't place on ordinary citizens. It's akin to a, a probation order that can run for the for essentially the entirety of your life. Uh, so certainly, uh, this case certainly involves and in how that impinges upon people's liberty rights uh, and whether that's justified in all circumstances. And certainly, what we put before the court is doesn't. Mr. Gurley, I want to turn to something you said in the last segment about the stigma associated with being on the registry and why the information on the registry isn't isn't public. Now, the, when someone's convicted of, of a sexual offense, you know, it, society puts the person in, in prison, the courts put them in prison uh, if, if they're sentenced to a term of imprisonment and uh, a term of probation. But the the registry in itself isn't supposed to be a form of punishment. Is that, is that accurate or, or do you think that in practice it, it does constitute a form of punishment? It's certainly not supposed to be a form of punishment. It's supposed to be a mechanism for protecting the public. Uh, the problem is that in our view, it does operate as a form of punishment and it operates as a form of punishment in many cases in perpetuity because for many offenses and in any case where the person's convicted of more than one offense, even if those offenses are committed at the same time, the court is required to order a lifetime of registration. And that's that's very um, anomalous in our justice system because we normally operate on the principle that you pay your debt to society, you do the sentence that's proportionate to the crime, and then you're, you're back in society as somebody enjoying the full rights of citizenship, subject to very unusual cases such as a dangerous offender proceeding where we find that somebody is just so dangerous that they have to be detained indefinitely. In every other case, we say you serve your sentence and then you're on your own. And this is a real exception to that because it requires people to be monitored by the state and to be labeled a sex offender in many cases for the rest of their natural lives. And in many cases, in, in our view, that simply won't be necessary for public protection and won't be proportionate to the degree of, of responsibility for the crime. Now, Mr. Badalek, your, your client in this case, Mr. Nedalu Vu, he was placed on the registry for, uh, for, for a lifetime period. Uh, but I, I know there are ways that people can have themselves taken off the registry. How, how easy is that to happen? How, how, what do you have to do in order to be removed from this, this registry once you're on it? Yeah, I, you can be removed, but it's after a, a longer period of time. I believe there's application periods depending upon uh, the offenses committed that can be 5, 10, or 20 years uh, in duration. Uh, but essentially, the difficulty with those uh, applications to be, to be removed is that they're based on, is this uh, your registration grossly disproportionate uh, to the value of having you on the registry? 
uh, and the question of is it grossly disproportionate for being for you being on the registry essentially asks have your rights been violated up until this time uh, so one of the arguments we made before the Supreme Court is essentially that you shouldn't have this period of 10 or 20 years uh, to find out if your rights have been violated for decades, essentially. Uh, it should be decided as it was previous to 2011 on application. Uh, if it's grossly disproportionate, it means it would invoke your Section 7 liberty rights, uh, essentially saying there, there's no real value for you being here uh, because your likelihood of reoffense uh, is so low. Essentially, putting you on this registry is accumulating useless information. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing Canada's sex offender registry and a recent legal challenge to it. Now, Mr. Badalek, I want to talk about this specific case challenging the automatic registration of, of, of a person who's convicted of two or more offenses. What, what can you tell me of the background of the case involving Mr. Nedelavu and, uh, and what you think our viewers need to know about it? Sure. I mean, this is a case that happened all the way back in 2011, uh, really shortly after the law was amended, removing judicial discretion uh, to be exempted from the registry. Uh, so this is a circumstance where a teenager uh, went to a party uh, that had a uh, somewhat suggestive Jersey Shore theme to it at the time, uh, and uh, he was picked up by the people he eventually offended to, taken to the party. Uh, he essentially became blackout drunk, and unfortunately, he committed uh, some sexual assaults in that stupor, uh, where engaging in some unwanted sexual uh, touching. Uh, he was a young man. He had essentially no criminal record whatsoever. Uh, as I said, we're now almost 11 years after the date of the offense, and he's never reoffended. Uh, and what people don't realize is that most sex offenders don't reoffend. It's really a subclass of them uh, who are kind of serial offenders who I think this law was intended to capture. Uh, but we're casting a very broad net. Uh, and, and, in, and in that doing so, we're capturing some people uh, that really, there's no public interest in so far as they're unlikely at any point to reoffend, according to the experts. Uh, because if you have someone who's a low risk of reoffense, uh, their chances of reoffending to begin with is something like 7%, and that halves every five years. Uh, so if we look at someone uh, who's already uh, been uh, released into the community for over five years, uh, we're looking at a risk of reoffense that's around two to three percent, and that's no greater than the spontaneous risk to the public of a sexual offense from anyone with a criminal record. So, Mr. Gourlay, the, if I'm getting this right, what this challenge is about is, is not saying there shouldn't be a sex offender registry. There should be a registry. It's just that the types of people it should include uh, are, are different. So, what can you tell us about um, you know, if this challenge succeeds, who, who would still be included? And, and what would the role for judges be here in determining who ends up on the registry and who doesn't? Sure. So the, the challenge brought by Mr. Badaluk and, and his co-counsel, as well as uh, the challenge that's supported by the, the intervener I acted for, um, asks the court uh, to do two things. One, restore the judicial discretion that was uh, a part of the law pre-2011, and two, get rid of these mandatory lifetime orders that are lifetime in duration without any, without any choice in the matter from the judge. Restoring an element of judicial discretion would allow a judge simply to say that in a given case, the person is such a low risk to reoffend that it would be grossly disproportionate to place that person on the registry. So the registry would continue to exist. It would continue to operate. It would simply cease to include these very low risk offenders on it. And we say that's a situation in which everybody wins, the accused and the, uh, and the public alike, because the public isn't really being protected by having these people on the registry. So Mr. Gourley, how would a judge determine if a person is low risk or, or not low risk? I do understand the concern of the public of, of not wanting um, to have a, a sex offender living beside them 
and the government not having any, any information about it. I mean, I, I do understand the public purpose here. So, so how do judges make that determination about if it's reasonable to include someone on that list? Judges make determinations of risk all the time. I mean, that's a large part of what the sentencing exercise itself is about. And, you know, it's, it's acknowledged, certainly I acknowledge that it's never possible to determine risk uh, to a perfect certainty. But what restoring judicial discretion would, would do is allow a judge uh, in some, a case like Mr. Nedelobus, a teenager uh, with, with no prior uh, bad conduct and uh, somebody who acted out of character in a way that um, clearly seems not to be part of a larger pattern to exempt a person like that from the registry. And, you know, it, everything carries risks. We acknowledge that. But uh, in our view, it's inherent in the individualized set, sentencing exercise that judges ought to be uh, given that trust to separate those people who really are risky from those people who aren't. So really, it's about, it's about what is the right balance to strike here. We've got to go to commercial break. But when we come back, I want to dig into this question and this topic a little bit deeper. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing Canada's sex offender registry and a recent legal challenge to it. Uh, now, Mr. Badaluk, this case is not the first challenge to the sex offender registry since um, the laws changed in 2011. There was another case in Ontario that also found parts of the law unconstitutional as it related to people who were found uh, not criminally responsible by way of mental disorder. So what can you tell me about that case, its similarities to this case we're discussing today and what the court found? Yeah, I, I mean, this case is somewhat different insofar as that concerned a specific uh, subset of people who had been deemed not criminally responsible and their ability to be removed from uh, the registry, essentially. Uh, and because of their not criminally responsible status, they weren't able to remove themselves. I think what that case has as a bearing on this particular case uh, is it's shown that the Supreme Court is at the very least uh, willing to look at uh, these types of situations and look at where it's dealing with people unjustly and unfairly uh, to have these kind of compulsorily long-term registrations that have no real uh, mechanic to uh, uh, to deal with uh, uh, with people who are whose circumstances don't really warrant a long-term registration. And it also kind of speaks to some of the, the issues that arose in some of the mandatory minimum cases where Justice McLaughlin said, if you have these kind of very hard lines uh, that are legislated, which don't really have any kind of escape valve, you're going to capture uh, people who are kind of very much the, the uh, minimum and kind of de minimis situation uh, where they don't really belong in the same category, and that's going to feel unjust. And essentially, what we have in the Charter are means to try and provide a remedy uh, to those particular situations. And uh, certainly, that's why I think the Supreme Court was willing to take up uh, Mr. Andelahu's case, and I, I think they are grappling with that issue. And uh, we'll see what they decide uh, later this year, I expect. So, Mr. Gourley, if this case is decided, it's a case coming out of Alberta, but it's gone to the Supreme Court, um, would it have national effect or would it be uh, only apply to Alberta? No, it would have national effect because uh, when the Supreme Court uh, states the law, it's a, the national court of last resort, and this is a, a federal law. This is the federal, the National Sex Offender Registry. So, if the court uh, is of the view that the portions of it that are challenged are unconstitutional, it will uh, presumably strike those portions down and, would, and then it would be up to the parliament to decide whether um, they wish to replace the legislation with something constitutionally compliant or, or leave it as is. And, and Mr. Gurley, you represented an intervener. Um, who, who was your intervener that you were representing and who were some of the other interveners? Because this, this case attracted a lot of attention. Um, and a lot of organizations were involved. It did. So I represented the HIV Legal Clinic of Ontario and the HIV Legal Network, which represents the interests of people living with HIV. And their concern was the impact of lifetime sex offender registry on people who are convicted of uh, 
uh, aggravated sexual assault for HIV non-disclosure, already a very vulnerable and marginalized population. So we were there to speak for their interest. Uh, it also attracted interest from the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Criminal Lawyers Association of Ontario, as well as a wide range of uh, provincial attorney generals who spoke on the opposite side uh, in support of these provisions. So, uh, Mr. Badalek, the case has already been argued. Uh, the Supreme Court is, is working on a decision. When do you think we might expect to hear back? Well, uh, generally speaking, the Supreme Court takes roughly six months uh, to uh, to release a decision. Uh, so I would expect sometime in the early fall, although obviously if they are the Supreme Court. If they need to take longer, they can certainly take longer. Uh, that's entirely at their discretion. But that would be kind of the usual time period we'd expect. Well, Mr. Gourlay, Mr. Badalek, I really appreciate you coming on today to share your experience, your expertise, and your time with us. It's a really fascinating topic that I think the public has a lot of interest in following for a whole variety of reasons. So thanks so much for coming on today to have this conversation. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. We've heard today about Canada's sex offender registry and some recent legal challenges to it. The sex offender registry serves an important public purpose and it's used by law enforcement to investigate crimes. But is the registry too inclusive? Would giving judges to determine who should be listed be better? How do we achieve the right balance? You be the judge. Thanks for watching and remember, a freer Canada starts with you.